All right, Brett Hepperman is going to present next. He's going to present uh, risk assessments for concrete arch dams and concrete buttress dams. These are modules E4 and E5. Brett is a structural engineer, senior structural engineer with the RMC out in Lakewood, Colorado. So Brett, whenever you're ready, the floor is yours. So the first presentation I'm going to go through is evaluating concrete arch dams. So the, the main objectives of the presentation are to run through the mechanisms that affect arch dam failure to be able to construct event trees that represent failure of arch dams and to explain how to estimate the notable probabilities of that event tree. So the first thing I'm going to jump into is discussing a case history for a concrete arch dam. Um, and this is Coima Dam out in California. It's a 370 foot high concrete arch dam that's roughly 10 and a half feet thick and 90 and 99 feet thick at the base. It's been subjected to two earthquakes in its history. The 1971 San Fernando earthquake and the 1971. So during the 1971 San Fernando event, there was the PGA measured at the base of the dam was approximately 0.4 G. And the pool at the time of the event was 148 feet below the crest. After the event, a crack was noted to have developed at the contraction joint in the thrust block, and there was extensive cracking in gunite that is located in the, the left abutment where approximately 72,000 square feet of material moved eight inches vertically and 10 inches horizontally. During the 1994 Northridge event, the measured PGA at the base was approximately half a G, and the pool elevation at the time of the event was 131 feet below the crest. There was a permanent offset noted at the crest after the North Ridge event and the thrust block and underlying rock mass appeared to have moved away from the thrust block. The dam did not fail during either of these events, um, but it very well could have if the, the upstream pool was at a higher elevation than it was at the time of the, the earthquakes. So moving on into some loading conditions that you will want to consider when evaluating concrete um, arch dams, the first one is normal loading. And generally the risk is fairly negligible for normal pool loadings, unless you have either analysis that indicates that um, you could have a potential problem or that there is a known um, adverse, crack pro adverse crack pattern in um, either the upstream or downstream face of the dam. Unless those exist, you can generally pretty well write off the, the loading conditions related to normal operations as you know, having pretty low risk. So what is an adverse crack problem? So these two pictures um, identify some potential adverse cracking and essentially the, the cracks you should be concerned with are ones that run parallel to the abutments. These types of cracks have the potential to either link up with the horizontal joints or horizontal cracking in the dam itself to potentially create movable blocks. Th these particular cracks shown here were created due to during low water conditions and high temperatures and resulting in deflection of the dam upstream, creating the cracking on the downstream face. Some other examples of some adverse cracks are shown here, which were created by ASR. And essentially, so the yellow cracks highlighted here are potentially an adverse crack pattern, because you know, again, we've got cracks that are somewhat parallel to the abutment and cracks that are horizontal in the, the center of the dam. And if they were to link up, they could create some movable blocks. Another example crack shown here is the one highlighted in, in pink, which is a also a fairly common crack you may come across. This is generally less concerning because the orientation is perpendicular to the abutment, which would make it a lot harder for it to link up with other cracks and joints, creating removable blocks within the dam. So moving on to flood loading, um, one thing I, I do want to note that overtopping of abut or, uh, arch dams causing erosion of the abutments is certainly a failure mode you're going to want to evaluate within a, a risk assessment. That's not a failure mode that I'm going to discuss here as part of this presentation, 
that's covered in other chapters. The focus of this presentation is um, issues initiated within the concrete itself that lead to uh, a failure of the dam. And kind of similar with the, the normal loading conditions, unless you already have an adverse cracking problem or you have analysis indicate that you, you, you could potentially have an issue, um, the additional um, load created by um, a flood event is generally not going to increase the risk associated with parts dam failure all that much, particularly when you consider the um, adding in the probability of the, the flood occurring. Like with normal loading, though, if you do have an adverse cracking problem, then you know, that's certainly something you're going to want to look into, and the increased loading could make it uh, a critical load case that you need to consider. So moving into seismic loading, typically this is going to be the, the type of loading that's going to drive the risk the most related to, to arch dam. Now, having said that, there actually have been no known arch dam failures due to earthquakes, but there have been um, shake table model studies that have indicated how these failure modes can initiate and ultimately progress to breach. Essentially, you start developing cracking within the center of the dam that's horizontal. Um, you also either have existing or developed cracking um, diagonal that's parallel to the abutments. These are able to link up, creating movable blocks, which then have the potential to rotate and get pushed downstream. So here's an example of vent tree, which basically more or less leads through the same progression that I just discussed where the first two nodes are related to the loading. So you have your reservoir loading as the first node. The, the loading associated with the earthquake is the next node. And then you get into the initiation and progression nodes, um, the first of which is you develop horizontal cracking. That Then you get diagonal cracking um, parallel to the abutments. These link up, creating um, isolated blocks. And those blocks ultimately get pushed downstream, re resulting in a breach. So when evaluating the risk associated with um, arch dams based on seismic loading, uh, unfortunately, the, you're really going to need a, a 3D time history finite element analysis that considers variations in reservoir, uh, temperature, and seismic loading in order to get a full appreciation of the response of the dam during the event. You can use that analysis and the results that come out of it to look at the, the tensile stresses and compare those to the tensile strength and determine what's the potential for initiating, initiating cracking, what's the likelihood of you know, that crack propagating all the way through the dam um, based on the location and the orientation of the cracks, and then use that information also to determine what is the probability of getting uh, kinematic displacement of those isolated blocks ultimately uh, leading to breach. One word of caution. Um, so when doing 3D finite element analyses, these can get really complicated in terms of building and also in terms of uh, deciphering the results. So you don't want to just jump in with the most sophisticated analysis that you could possibly do. You want to start with relatively simple, and I use the term relative, because you know, you're still dealing with a finite element analysis, but use like a linear elastic analysis that has a massless foundation. Maybe it has some a little bit more conservative assumptions. And if that analysis indicates that you don't have a problem or you can't develop cracking, then you know, the risk is probably gonna be pretty low. If those more simplified models indicate there is a potential reason to be concerned if you're able to, uh, you're able to yeah, determine that you could have a, an adverse cracking pattern, then, you know, you may want to move into more sophisticated analyses, you know, such as nonlinear and ones that use less conservative assumptions. So here's some example outputs from a finite element analysis. Uh, these two figures identify the, the tensile stresses on the upstream and downstream face of a, a particular arch dam, and so you can use this information and compare it to the, the tensile capacity, and you can draw lines that are normal to the stresses that exceed your capacity to determine whether or not you actually could develop an adverse cracking problem on both the upstream 
and downstream face. And based on the orientation and the location of those cracks, um, you can determine what is the potential to possibly crack through as well. Here's some more examples of potential outputs. Um, the one identifies an area of high stress within the center of an arch dam that may be an area where you've exceeded your tensile capacity. And the other figure represents a time history stress plot um, where you can identify what, how does the, the tensile stresses in the dam at a particular location vary throughout the event. And you can use these um, time history plots to compare to your capacity and determine whether or not you've exceeded the capacity, how many times, uh, how long, uh, how long, like what is the duration of the exceedance and by and how many instances did you get that exceedance to determine, help you identify what is not only the potential for initiating cracking, but what's the potential for that cracking to propagate and maybe actually crack all the way through the dam. So even if analysis identifies that you do have a, an adverse cracking problem and maybe even there is potential for you to completely crack through, that doesn't mean you have a breach. There's still a couple of questions that you need to ask in order to fully evaluate the risk. And the first is, how likely is it that a cracking pattern will be adverse enough to allow for actual block displacement? So if the, the pattern is not similar on both the upstream and downstream sides, let's say you have a, a more widespread cracking problem on the downstream face, but it's a much more isolated area on the upstream face, you may not actually be able to develop an actual movable block. Yeah, that would be able to move downstream. And even if you do, the next question is, what is the likelihood that the crack condition manifests early enough in the earthquake that you can actually push it downstream? So even if you get, you develop cracking, it cracks all the way through, you develop these isolated blocks. If this doesn't, if this doesn't occur until like the very end of the earthquake, you probably aren't gonna have enough energy to actually move it downstream and you may not actually get a breach and uh, develop any consequences. So another failure mode that you're gonna to want to consider when evaluating concrete arch dams is also essentially sliding at the base, you know, the rock uh, concrete contact. This is typically more of a concern for non-radial but abutments um, that have the that can open up in the downstream direction. Um, essentially what happens is under strong shaking, the contact could become broken and the individual monoliths of the arch could eventually slide at their base. If the upper blocks in the arch, you know, towards the abutment, you know, start to move, then your arching action will be lost. And this will be a very critical scenario for your thin arch stands. They typically, they, they don't have a whole lot of redundancy and if they lose the arching action, there's not much else they have to rely on. It, it's still potentially a concern, but maybe a little bit less of a concern if you have a thicker arch. Yeah, uh, these types of dams yeah, do have the potential to be stable from a two-dimensional standpoint, but it's still something you're gonna want to evaluate. So here's an example of entry for basically sliding at the contact. And the beginning is fairly similar to the one that I showed previously related to cracking in within the concrete itself, where your first couple of nodes are related to the loading. Then you get into your initiation and progression nodes. In this example, you start with separation of the contact. You lose your, your arching action. Um, in this example, we ask the question, well, what's the potential for increasing your uplift pressures? If you do increase the uplift at the base, that increases the potential that you could actually have instability within the arch. But as identified by the fact that we have essentially breach nodes on both the yes and no branch, you don't actually have to increase your uplift pressures to get instability, particularly if you've lost the arch in action. As is the case with looking at the internal failure of the concrete, um, it really, it's most helpful if you have a, a finite element analysis uh, to rely on in order to determine what is the probability, um, particularly determining what's the potential for developing separation and, and uh, at the contact. 
If you don't have this information, um, you can still you know, evaluate the risk. It's going to be largely based on engineering judgment. Um, you can you know, try and do some calculations on what are the stress levels at the contact and use uh, concrete uh, properties. Yeah, you're understanding concrete properties to determine what is the potential thing gets sliding. Um, the main question you still need to ask is what's the amount of displacement you think you're likely going to get, uh, and is this going to result in a loss of arching action? The other thing that you'll want to also keep in mind is what is the risk of getting a failure after the event? Um, you know, you may not have enough energy to actually result in failure during the, the earthquake, but if you damage the structure enough, it may not have the ability to yeah, resist a sustained static loading that acts on the dam after the event. So some key takeaways for evaluating arch dams is that they are generally forgiving structures as long as the abutments can carry the load. They yeah, generally performed well, um, and that there's generally limited chance of structural failure under normal loading conditions or even small increases in the reservoir. Although there are no known arch dams to have failed due to earthquakes, these typically represent the, the highest, the largest risk um, associated with these types of dams. And that 3D finite element analyses are typically going to be needed in order to evaluate the behavior in order to get the full understanding of the response of the structure. All right. So now I will jump over to buttress dams one second. All right, so the next presentation is related to buttress dams and evaluating the risk associated with these. And so the learning objectives are very similar to uh, concrete arch dams is that we want to understand the mechanisms that affect these types of dams and be able to construct an event tree that represents failure, and then how do we estimate the nodal probabilities of that event tree? So I'm gonna first start off you know, looking at the, the load path and some various types of budget stamps that you might come across in doing risk assessments. So the, the, the first thing is that Butcher stamps, that they consist of a concrete water barrier that is used to transmit the load into the foundation through the buttresses. Um, this, this water barrier is going to be critical and it needs to have a sufficient slope yeah, in the upstream direction so that you can yeah, account, you know, take advantage of some of the, the weight of water of the upstream pool to increase the downward normal force into the foundation. Uh, these, these types of dams were a lot more common in the earliest 20th century when the, the concrete, the materials were less expensive or the, the material was more expensive, but labor was less expensive. Now that things have kind of you know, flipped, you know, you, they're a lot less common in terms of new construction. And so the, the main takeaway is when you're evaluating these types of structures, they're likely to be pretty old. And there's things you're gonna relate it to the concrete that you're gonna wanna keep in mind in terms of the era, era of construction. Some typical examples of buttress dams that you may come across. Uh, the first one is a slab and buttress, also known as an Amberson dam. There's also multiple arch buttress dams, massive head buttresses, and domes. So now I'm going to talk about a couple of case histories. Um, the first one is the Vega de Terra dam, which was constructed in the mid-1950s in northwest Spain. It was a 112-foot-high dam that was constructed of masonry and work was suspended during the winter months. And unfortunately, there was little attention paid to prepping the joints after the winter shutdown, resulting in poor bond. The dam failed upon first filling in January 1959, resulting in 144 fatalities. Now, officially, the, the report that the failure is attributed to poor bond within the concrete due to, um, you know, in a, not paying attention to joint prep after the, the winter shutdown. But another contributing factor is likely the, the lack of upstream slope on the, the concrete slab upstream you know, highlighted in this picture. So basically there was very limit, this helped limit the amount of weight that can be helped or be used to transmit or increase the normal load within the foundation. 
from the upstream pool and uh, probably contributed to some degree to failure of the dam. The next uh, example that I'm going to run through is the Gleno Dam in Italy. It was a 160 foot high uh, multiple arch buttress dam that had a 152 foot tall masonry plug that was constructed in the Valley Gorge. Originally, it was designed as a gravity dam, but was modified during construction and ultimately failed in October 1923 after two, being loaded for two months and resulted in 356 fatalities. And again, um, here, the, the official report indicated that the masonry plug was the main cause for failure, but like with the, the previous example, there's other uh, contributing factors, one of which could have been just poor concrete quality within the, the buttress itself highlighted by the, this picture. You can see that you know, there's differences in quality in the, the concrete, and there is likely to be some poor bond within the buttress. Now, unlike most dams that fail upon first filling, this dam survived for two months, which raises the question, so what exactly changed that, that caused the conditions for the, the dam to fail? One theory is that the lime mortar yeah, was able to leach out of the, the masonry plug within the valley, allowing it to deform such that the buttress, yeah, yeah, more than what the buttress could take and ultimately leading to dam failure. Uh, kind of supporting this theory was a finite element analysis that was done after the event occurred, where it basically highlighted that once they removed the, the masonry plug from the model, they started to get cra a cracking pattern that was similar to what they were seeing um, in the buttresses after the failure. And essentially, what the model started to indicate was that they were getting perpendicular cracking to the upstream face which is this very similar cracking pattern that was that existed in some of the buttresses after the dam failure. So getting into some of the key loading considerations that you will want to consider when evaluating the, the risk associated with buttress dams. So like with arch dams, seismic loading is probably going to be the main risk driver associated with these types of dams. Um, this is an example of vent tree, um, the failure of a buttress dam. The first two nodes are related to the loading for the reservoir and earthquake. And in this particular example, we have struts that span between the buttresses providing lateral support. And so first we need to fail the struts in compression that leads to increase or the buttress moment exceeding the capacity, um, which ultimately leads to uh, excessive deformation in the buttress then failure of the buttress and ultimately failure of the dam itself. One thing to note for so that particular event tree focused on the buttress and struts within the buttress and it does not really touch on any issues associated with the upstream slab corbels or the arches or, or domes if they are present. These are all components that you will want to consider when doing a risk assessment. Um, but they're not specifically called out in this particular example. All right, so like with arch dams, when evaluating the buttress dams, particularly for seismic loading, you're gonna to need to do a 3D finite time history model, and you're gonna to need to really model the entire dam itself. One of the reasons why is the buttress dams are designed to carry load in the upstream downstream direction, but they tend to be fairly vulnerable in the cross canyon. And in order to get a full understanding of the response in the cross canyon direction, because the load and the displacements will have a tendency to accumulate as you move across the structure, you, do, you need to model the entire dam itself in order to get the full response. As is the case with arch dams though, we don't want to just jump into the most uh, sophisticated 3D models that we uh, possibly do. We want to start with something simple. Um, again, I say relatively simple because we're dealing with finite element analyses. Something that's a linear elastic with, math with, with a massless foundation. Um, and then if these more simplified models indicate that you have, you have reasons to be concerned or potential to exceed the capacity of the buttress or any of the other components within the dam, then you can move to more sophisticated, complicated models. One thing that you're going to want to pay very close attention to is the reinforcing steel. Um, buttress dams 
tend to behave like reinforced concrete structures. And so the adequacy of the reinforcing is going to be critical to their ability to um, properly resist the loading on them. As I stated in the beginning, a lot of these dams tend to be really old. And so they could have a lot of concrete spalls, crackling, cracking, and they may not have the necessary air entrainment that we would include within our concrete mix designs for a modern design. Um, and so these are some key things. You're going to want to look closely into the reinforcing details to get an idea of, you know, how well, what kind of capacity do we have within the buttresses, you know, given that these are generally going to be relatively old structures. The also thing, another thing we need to keep in mind is because we have a sloped upstream face, you can't really use the Western Guard simplified method is not going to be a very good approximation of the hydrodynamic load being transmitted into the buttress dams. And another approach that you can use that will give you a better approximation is the Zangar approach, um, which you can, based on the orientation of the upstream face, you can determine what is the, the magnitude uh, of the hydrodynamic load being transferred into the buttress. Again, in this particular example, we have struts um, that span between our, our buttress providing lateral support. So the first thing you need to do is determine what's the likelihood of those being exceeded. And these, this is two example outputs from a finite element analysis detailing what is the compressive stress within the struts at uh, various locations. And you can use the time history plot and compared to the capacity of the struts to determine, well, what's the likelihood of exceeding uh, or failing these struts based on whether or not their capacity is exceeded, uh, how many times, by what magnitude, and, and what duration to determine what is to help inform a probability for failing the struts. And then here's another example output related to the struts. Basically, the, the point of this slide is that evaluating a bunch of stand with struts could be a, uh, an iterative process. So the, the top part of this figure with the yellow highlights identifies which struts within the dam were identified for output. Um, and then of those, the middle figure, the ones that highlighted in red, are indicate which of those struts have exceeded their capacity and are considered to have failed. Um, those struts were then removed from the model, and then the model was rerun to determine what is the redistribution of the load and what does that do to the other struts within the dam. And that's highlighted here in the bottom figure with the, the blue and purple boxes indicating which, you know, upon the additional runs, which struts ultimately then exceeded their capacity based on the redistribution of the load. And so there's a whole process just kind of can be a little bit of an iteration to determine, okay, how, how is this dam going to respond and what's the potential for exceeding the capacity within these members? Here's some more example output. The top uh, figure identifies where it could be areas of high stress within the buttress, and then the bottom two figures identify what is a time history plot of the maximum principal stress? And again, you can use these time history plots to determine what is the potential for exceeding the capacity, um, in this case of the, the buttress uh, itself, you know, how many times is the capacity exceeded, um, for what magnitude, and to get an idea of what is the potential of overstressing these members. And then uh, here's some other examples. Uh, this is a time history plot of the flexural stress with an abutment. The, the main thing to keep in mind here is that it's fairly common that with buttresses that they're going to increase in their thickness as you get closer to the foundation. And so you may want to evaluate multiple elevations within the, the buttress to determine what is whether or not the capacity is exceeded to get a full understanding of what is the response. And again, here we can use time history plots to get an understanding as to what is the potential for exceeding the capacity and yeah, what's the likelihood of ultimately overstressing the buttress. So when doing finite element analyses, particularly if you have to then move into more sophisticated analyses such as nonlinear, 
Um, these can be very helpful in that they can help you understand the potential of cracking, yielding of the rebar, and whether or not you're going to get excessive deformation. But we need to be careful when we're using these, these types of models. Uh, essentially, the outputs are only going to be as good as the, the input assumptions and the boundary conditions. And these are very complicated models to not only build, but then to decipher the results. And so before you start getting too deep into these types of models, you want to do a lot of validation of your model and use some relatively simple or known loading conditions where you know what the, the results should be to make sure that the, the model is actually providing re reasonable and realistic results. So what are some key takeaways for, for buster stamps? Basically, they're designed to carry load in the upstream downstream direction, but they tend to be fairly vulnerable, particularly to seismic loads in the cross canyon direction. Uh, we are going to need uh, finite element analyses in order to understand the full structural response. Yeah, reinforced concrete uh, concepts yeah, can be used to determine what is the probability, yeah, the nodal estimates for the various uh, nodes for the event tree. We need to pay very careful consideration to the quality of the concrete, joint treatment, and reinforcing details, particularly since of the age of these structures. Yeah, they tend to be um, early 19, early 20th century structures. And then lastly, the, the level of analysis should be commensurate with the level of the study. Essentially, we don't want to start off with the most complicated models. Um, use something relatively simplistic and determine if you have a problem and then move into more complicated models um, as you progress. Are there any questions? Any questions for Brett on arch or buttress dams? All right, I don't see any, Brett. Thank you. <laughs> 